In my family, we harbor a terrible secret. This all happened about a year ago, when an elderly couple moved in next door. They used to live in Tokyo, but moved out to the countryside to live out their final years surrounded by nature. Initially, I was apprehensive about having new neighbors, but once I met them, I figured there wouldn't be any trouble. The husband would regularly walk around the neighborhood, and I often saw him. The wife would also come over from time to time with some food, always saying she had cooked a bit too much. It was a nice, neighborly gesture, and the flavors and seasoning she used were quite unique. Everything she made was delicious, and my family would often ask if there were any side dishes from the neighbors next door at dinner time. I remember when there weren't any. They would look a little upset by that. Since our parents lived far away, it was nice to have a kindly grandmother figure popping in with treats every now and then. The couple wasn't causing any trouble at all. And after a while, we became quite close with them. However, after about a year, I started to notice that we hadn't seen the old lady's husband for quite a while. I thought it was a bit strange, so I asked my husband if he had seen him. He thought he had seen him in a park recently, or perhaps outside gardening, but he couldn't be certain. I suggested we ask the old lady if her husband was okay. Maybe he was sick or something, and there was something we could do to help. The next day, she arrived at our house with a stew, and my husband asked about her husband. She said he was suffering in the summer heat and had been staying indoors a lot more lately. We all dived into the delicious stew she had brought over. It tasted quite good, unlike anything I'd ever had before. The kids squabbled over second and third helpings. I was so impressed that I asked her to teach me how to cook this dish as well. I followed the instructions she gave me to the letter was never quite the same. Something about that really bothered me. Then one day, I heard sirens outside, and I was terribly worried something might have happened to the old man next door. My husband said they were not ambulance sirens, but instead the siren of police vehicles. We went to take a look outside, and the police had stopped outside our neighbor's house leading the old lady outside in handcuffs. Just before they put her in the police car, she looked me dead in the eyes and threw her head back, laughing a demented laugh that chilled me to the bone. Immediately, I got a sinking feeling, feeling extremely queasy. An hour or two later, a detective approached us and asked us to cooperate with his investigation answering some questions. He filled us in on the situation. Our neighbor's husband's sister had been quite concerned about his well-being. She hadn't heard from him for about two months. Despite trying to contact him multiple times and leaving messages with his wife, when the man's brother and sister showed up to visit and check up on him, they grew more and more suspicious, noticing dark stains on the carpet in the house, and they called the police, suspecting the old lady had killed him. The detective believed the murder had been committed as well. The old lady told them she had chopped up the old man's body, but they couldn't find any of the body parts. When I heard him say those words, I must have turned as pale as a ghost. I looked over at my husband, and I could tell we were thinking the exact same thing food from next door, those most recent stews and other things, had been full of that mysterious meat. That night, my husband and I threw up uncontrollably. I asked him what we should do with this situation, and he said there was nothing we could do. We decided to stay silent, as we didn't want to incriminate ourselves. You have to understand, in Japanese society, how our family would be seen if we told the truth of having disposed of our kindly neighbor's remains by eating them, even if it was 
unintentional. It may be quite difficult for you to understand, but that's simply how it is around here. What we chose to do was keep it a secret. The old lady was going to be arrested anyway. We couldn't tell the children either. Obviously, that would scar them for life. When I was 18, two of my friends and I moved in together into an apartment. We all worked regular jobs while doing online school. And with the three of us combined, the rent was easily affordable. Over the following year though, one of them moved out, leaving just the two of us left to pay the bill. It was still affordable, but much less so than it used to be. It even had me stressing out a couple of times. After a few months, my other friend moved out as well. It wasn't either of their faults for having to leave, but it still really sucked. And I was forced to find somewhere else to live on just my small paychecks. There weren't a lot of options within my budget, but I was willing to take anything as long as it was a roof over my head. Eventually, I found a listing for an apartment on the other side of town. From the pictures, it looked like a small building with only eight rooms in total, and definitely not very nice on the inside. Still, the price was okay with me, so I sent a request to tour it. I went there later that night, and I met the owner, Jackson, who walked me through the room. It was really small, and not that great either. But again, there wasn't much I could do about it. The following week, I moved in. Once I got more used to the place, it actually wasn't that bad. Sure, it wasn't very clean, and it did look really old, but it had all the basic things I needed. The only thing that felt weird was this one door in the hallway, right across from my room, almost looking like it had to be another bedroom or something. During the tour, Jackson said my place was actually connected to the neighbors, and that door was shared between both our apartments. He explained that it always stayed locked from both sides, and I could just safely ignore it, assuming it was exactly like a wall. Sometimes, though, I felt like it was a little bit weird, like they could hear everything going on in my apartment. And on the flip side, I always felt like I had to be extra quiet so as not to disturb them somehow. The door was very clearly thin, so sound had to be getting through easily. For the first week or so, though, I never heard anything from the other side not a single peep of noise or anything. It wasn't until one night, after working late, I was sitting on the couch watching some TV when I suddenly heard a really loud thud from the hallway. I walked over, thinking something must have fallen over in my room. But then, I noticed a bit of light moving around under the door to the other apartment. It looked like maybe a phone flashlight or something. I listened for a little bit, trying not to be too creepy, but just wanting to know what was going on. After all, that was the first time I'd ever seen or heard anything from their apartment. After only a minute, the light turned off, and no more sounds came from behind the door. I went back to the couch and stayed up for another hour before going to bed. Throughout the night, occasionally be awoken by soft thuds or footsteps coming from around that door in the hallway. I never got up to check though, because I knew there was nothing to really check on. It gave me an eerie feeling for some reason though, knowing they were up the entire night doing something in the dark of their own room. This went on for a few days, only hearing noises late at night when most people would be sleeping. I never heard anyone talking though, or really anything other than thuds and footsteps. Then one night, something was different. I woke up to a thud far louder than any of the others I'd heard. I immediately shot up in my bed, my eyes wide open, staring at my door across the room. Something about that sound sent chills through me. 
making me feel like this was something I needed to check. I slowly and quietly got out of my bed and walked over to my door, leaning against it and listening into the hallway. There seemed to be nothing. It was completely silent. I carefully opened the door, looking across the hall, and felt my body go numb. The door in the hallway was open. I hesitated, unsure what to do. I crept into the hallway and looked behind the partially open doorway. I almost didn't believe what I saw. It was a bedroom, slightly smaller than my own, but it was empty aside from a single mattress on the ground. There were no doorways leading anywhere else. It was just a single room with no way in or out, except for the door in my apartment. I ran and got my phone, dialing 911 as I looked all around my apartment to make sure nobody was hiding. Whoever was in there seemed to have left. The police came and did their investigation. But strangely enough, Jackson never picked up his phone. Soon, we found out that Jackson probably wasn't even who he said he was. We never heard or saw from him again. As for the room itself, it's honestly just a puzzling situation. It could have been Jackson or somebody who was hiding, living in there, trying not to get noticed. Or it could have been someone else unrelated entirely. Maybe they broke out, and that's what the sounds were. To this day though, clearly belligerent and under the influence of something. I'm sure him seeing my pistol would have just sent him more over the edge. My hands were now up, and my girlfriend was shaking in fear. I eventually muttered out, What's going on, sir? The man threw his rotten and missing teeth, then screamed at me, You sons of B asterisk 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 came out here tearing up my field and running over my crops. He had clearly mistaken me for some of the ATV riders around the area who often would wander onto private property and tear up the land. Looking at the man, though, he didn't look like any of the farmers I knew around the area. Having lived there for 15 years at this point, I was fairly familiar with everybody. Well, this supposed farmer looked maybe in his early 30s and looked more like what I would see of the junkies roaming around downtown. I told the man that I'd never been here before nor was I responsible for destroying his crops either. I was trying desperately to defuse the situation. He wanted to hear none of it and continued to mutter while still holding me at gunpoint. I waited for a break in his incoherent babbling to apologize profusely. Sir, if I had seen a no trespassing sign, I wouldn't have dared to step foot on the property. The man advanced from behind my truck to my open window, then yelled again. You didn't see no sign, yeah right. He didn't believe me. As I studied him, he continued to grip the rifle even tighter and mumbled something to himself. I apologized some more and offered to leave. That's when I noticed he had me completely blocked in and there was nowhere to go. As soon as I mentioned leaving, perked up and dropped the rifle ever so slightly, putting us out of immediate danger. My fight or flight briefly chose to fight, but I knew there was no way to jump out of the truck and get to him before he could shoot us. Time seemed to slow down, and I felt like the silence that ensued lasted for hours. He then started to yell obscenities again. He started to walk back to his truck. Though as he passed my rear bumper, my girlfriend and I exchanged glances. I had never seen fear like that in someone's eyes before, let alone someone that I loved. I knew I had to do whatever I could to get away from this unhinged stranger. I fired up my truck and put it in reverse. He did the same, and the beat-up Ford backed into the road and stopped, waiting for me to exit. I backed into the road as well, my eyes never leaving the rearview mirror. As soon as there was enough space, I threw the truck in drive 
and stamped that gas pedal down as far as it could go. My tires squealed, and the truck roared as it ran through the gears. I was familiar with the roads, and confident I could outrun him if need be. As his truck looked like it was on its last legs, the speedometer flew past 60. I could see the man was trying to follow us, but there was enough distance between us that it would be hard for him to catch up. My girlfriend was calming down at this point and trying to rationalize what just happened to us. I drove and drove for several miles, constantly checking behind us to see if he was still following. I remember doing 100 miles an hour at some point. The mood in the cab eventually changed to utter disbelief as we then talked about how crazy this supposed farmer looked. We awkwardly laughed off our near deaths and never saw that man again. After, I never returned to that abandoned house except for the next day to leave him some ruts in the front yard of the rundown property. Looking back, I haven't the slightest idea as to how the man even knew we were there. As we weren't visible from the road, nor had we been followed on the way there. Personally, I think he was just some new and fancy compared to my hand-me-down furniture and outdated appliances. We didn't care, though we were happy just being together. He treated me like a princess, and I couldn't have asked for more. I eventually moved into his place officially, and we started planning our future together. We talked about marriage kids and where we wanted to settle down. Tyler was ambitious and had big dreams for us. He wanted to travel the world and experience different cultures. Before we settled down in our dream home, somewhere near the coast, I was excited to embark on this journey with him. He made me feel alive and hopeful for the future. Everything seemed perfect until one day when Tyler came home, looking troubled. He told me he had received some devastating news. His parents had been involved in a car accident and they didn't make it. I was stunned and didn't know what to say or do to comfort him. We held each other and cried for what felt like hours Tyler was inconsolable. And I felt utterly helpless seeing him in so much pain. It was a dark time for both of us. As we tried to navigate through the grief and loss, Tyler became withdrawn and distant. He stopped talking about our plans for the future and seemed to have lost his zest for life. I tried my best to support him and be there for him, but it felt like I was losing him too. I didn't know how to reach him help him heal from such a profound loss. Our relationship started to crumble under the weight of. Our grief and I felt like I was losing my best friend and the love of my life. It was heartbreaking to see us drift apart after everything we had been through together. I didn't know if we would ever be able to find our way back to each other, but I was willing to fight for us and hold on to the hope that we could overcome this tragedy together. Professionals in our respective fields, and we've managed to create a comfortable life together despite the traumatic experience. Our relationship only grew stronger. Tyler's perspective on material possessions shifted, and he began to appreciate the simpler things in life. We learned to cherish each moment together realizing that our bond was far more valuable than any material possession. The robbery served as a wake-up call for both of us, reminding us of the fragility of life and the importance of prioritizing what truly matters. We became more cautious about our surroundings and took steps to ensure our safety without letting fear consume us. Over time, the scars from that night faded lessons learned remained ingrained in our minds. Looking back, it's remarkable how adversity can bring people closer together 
Despite the initial shock and fear, we emerged from the experience with a newfound appreciation for each other and a deeper understanding of resilience. Today, as we navigate life's challenges together, we do so with a sense of gratitude for the strength we found in each other during our darkest moments. Despite having the means to afford almost anything, my partner and I maintained a humble existence. The incident of robbery taught us a profound lesson. No amount of wealth is worth endangering one's life. This anecdote was recounted to me by a seasoned murder investigator with over 30 years of experience. It occurred during the late 1980s in a region primarily covered by dense pine forests, with sparse towns scattered along the highways between cities. One particular evening, a young woman in her early 20s found herself on a motor coach journey home as winter approached, the freezing temperatures settling in after nightfall. In her drowsiness, she missed her intended stop. Realizing this only shortly after passing it, she faced a dilemma. Either a light at the next city where she knew no one, or disembark immediately and trek back, a three-hour walk. Explaining her predicament to the bus driver, he pulled over at the next available space and let her off. Tragically, this marked the last sighting of her Nearly 15 years later, her remains were discovered by a hiker deep within the dense and nearly impenetrable forest. Her body bound to a tree. Despite extensive investigation, her assailant was never apprehended. Shockingly, the victim was the girlfriend of the narrator, who learned of the harrowing ordeal from her first hand. At the time, both were students at a small college the narrator resided in the dorms. Katie, the girlfriend, hailed from the same area and often visited. One Friday evening, they opted for a quiet night in the narrator's room, as Katie's roommate was away. However, an unsettling incident had occurred earlier that evening, as Katie waited alone at a dimly lit bus stop. As she stood there, a van repeatedly passed by, driver making unsettling remarks. Though initially dismissive, Katie grew uneasy as the van persisted. When the driver finally stopped and offered her a ride, she declined, feeling apprehensive. Boarding the bus instead, she soon noticed the van trailing closely behind. Concerned for her safety, Katie reached out to the narrator, who offered support over the phone until she safely reached her destination. The narrative underscores the vulnerability individuals, particularly young women, may face in isolated settings and the importance of remaining vigilant in such situations. College dorm room, Katie's arrival was marked by hysteria, requiring over an hour of consolation before she could articulate her distressing encounter. She recounted how the van ceased its pursuit after being halted by a red light, allowing the bus to gain distance. However, upon disembarking at her stop, the van resumed its erratic pursuit, blocking her path toward the college. In a panic, she fled in the opposite direction, only to realize the driver brandishing a menacing knife. Desperately, she maneuvered back toward the college, the assailant hot on her trail. Miraculously, his stumble on an icy patch afforded her a critical lead, dissuading further pursuit, though not without ominous threats of retribution. Since then, Katie opted to drive herself, shunning public transport. Subsequently, the narrator shares a chilling personal encounter from about a month prior. While innocuously heading to a local pub, they found themselves accosted by a menacing stranger. His sudden fixation and aggressive approach 
triggered an instinctual flight response, culminating in a harrowing chase to safety. Despite the confrontation unfolding in plain sight, the bystander response was non-existent, leaving the narrator unnerved and shaken. Reflecting on their teenage years, the narrator recalls an unsettling incident involving heavy breathing outside their window. Encouraged by their parents to sleep with open curtains for ventilation, a night of compliance revealed a disturbing presence lurking just beyond their room, instilling a lasting sense of unease. These narratives intertwine to underscore the vulnerability individuals face in seemingly mundane situations, emphasizing the importance of vigilance and swift action in the face of danger. I was startled awake by a commotion outside my window. Startled, I glanced over and was met with the unsettling sight of a man staring back at me. My instinct was to call out for my dad, and as soon as I did, the intruder bolted, leaping over the fence. The reality of the situation sunk in as my dogs began barking furiously. When my father burst into the room, I pointed frantically at the window, where he spotted a suspicious car at the bottom of our driveway. Moments later, three more men appeared at my window, only to be met with my father's calm demeanor. He managed to scare them off with a simple remark, and they were later apprehended by the police. The incident left me shaken, unable to sleep with the blinds open. Months later, when my cat went missing, I ventured into the woods to search for him. Guided only by the faint light of my flashlight, I spotted my cat several times, but he seemed spooked, darting away whenever I drew near. As I turned to head back home, I encountered a mysterious figure, a man with nondescript features, except for the fact that his eyes were concealed. Despite my attempts to engage him, he remained silent, his unsettling presence prompting me to flee back to safety. Since that night, I've been plagued by the sound of tapping at my window every few weeks, a chilling reminder of the encounter, too frightened to investigate. I'm haunted by the possibility of encountering the mysterious man once more. Reflecting on past encounters, I recalled a particularly eerie incident from my teenage years. Waiting at an abandoned gas station to meet a dealer, I was interrupted by the ringing of a payphone nearby, transporting me back to the early 90s when payphones were still in use. As the sun began to set on the outskirts of downtown, I found myself alone at the abandoned gas station. The only sound being the ringing of the nearby payphone. With curiosity piqued, I answered the call, despite knowing my name wasn't Chad. However, the man on the other end seemed undeterred by my protests, persistently addressing me as Chad and expressing disturbing intentions. Despite my attempts to clarify the misunderstanding, the caller delved into graphic descriptions of his plans ignoring my protests. It was when he accurately described my appearance, down to the details of my clothing, that a chill ran down my spine. Panic set in as I realized there was no one else around to have observed me. Without hesitation, I hung up the phone and scanned my surroundings, finding no sign of another soul. Fear gripping me, I swiftly fled the scene jumping into my car and driving away as fast as I could. The encounter left me shaken, questioning the reality of what had just transpired in that desolate setting.